This is Money Mind on CNA 938. I'm Chu Wee Lin with Stanley Leong. Faced with constant coverage about the coronavirus, many of you might have forgotten about another life-threatening virus that has no cure. I'm referring to the human immunodeficiency virus, more commonly referred to as HIV. It's a viral infection that affects the immune system and without treatment, the body is less able to fight off other infections. The late stage of the HIV infection is known as Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome or AIDS. And since it's World AIDS Day today, it's only fitting that we highlight the fact that HIV remains a global epidemic. 2019 data from the United Nations show that around 38 million people globally are living with HIV, and some 32 million have died of AIDS-related illnesses. AIDS first entered the public consciousness in the 1980s when the media began reporting on a frightening illness that seemed to cause otherwise healthy people to die from rare forms of cancer and pneumonia. As a large number of the gay community was affected, the condition was mistakenly named gay-related immune deficiency for about six months in 1982. But we now know that AIDS can affect anyone. The virus is spread by contact with certain bodily fluids of a person with HIV, most commonly during unprotected sex and through the sharing of injection drug equipment. So today, there is no cure for HIV, but with advances in treatment, it is no longer a death sentence. So is there still a stigma attached to HIV and AIDS now that HIV can be controlled? And with the world currently focusing on containing COVID-19, how has this impacted the fight to end AIDS? Joining us to talk about this is Professor Roy Chan, President of Action for AIDS Singapore. It's a non-governmental organization that's dedicated to fighting AIDS and HIV infection in Singapore. Thanks very much for joining us today, Professor. Now tell us, have public fears about HIV and AIDS dwindled over the years, especially now that HIV appears to be treatable and also because COVID-19 seems to have overshadowed everything else? Good morning, William and Stanley. Thank you for having me and a happy World AIDS Day to you. Um, so public fears, I think generally speaking, um, most people may fear HIV less because really the um, the availability of very effective treatment has transformed HIV from a disease that was almost always fatal to an infection that can be effectively treated and controlled. So persons with infection on optimum treatment are able to stay healthy and remain well for as long as um, HIV uninfected people. However, I think that um, public fears uh, may have dwindled, but the issue of stigma and discrimination around the disease is still extremely high in Singapore. Um, your question on how COVID-19 has affected those with HIV AIDS, um, we were initially con concerned about patients living with HIV and those, and even those on treatment, whether or not they would be um, more severely affected by COVID-19. Um, initial evidence um, from some studies seemed to, uh, seemed to suggest that maybe there was an increased risk of contracting COVID for people with HIV. Um, but on analysis, it seemed that the, related, that the increased risk was probably related to increased age as well as presence of coexisting chronic diseases such as diabetes. There have been other studies from, big studies from Europe, the US and China, which showed that HIV does not actually increase the risk of HIV or person dying of, uh, of COVID-19. Um, therefore, recommendations for people living with HIV to keep themselves safe from COVID are the same as those for the general public. Right. And would you think that there's also a need to remind listeners that while, yes, treatment uh, and, you know, drugs and treatment and therapy has, has improved in terms of, um, you know, prolonging and giving a, a better uh, life uh, to those who have HIV, but that it's still not a cure. A cure has not yet been found. You think there's an important need to remind listeners about that as well? That's absolutely correct. I think um, we, always, we always say that, you know, it's, whilst we can certainly keep... Um, persons uh, living full, healthy, and, and uh, lengthy lives, um, it is not a cure. Persons with HIV have to take medications on a daily basis. So if one imagines uh, getting infected when you're 20 years old, it's, uh, it's a long, uh, decades ahead of, of daily medications. Um, of course, with time, the medications have certainly have improved in, in terms of, uh, ease of ease of taking. You take sometimes just one pill a day, but they are not devoid of uh, toxicity and side effects. And, um, um, you know, there is always the, the, the need for, for monitoring of, uh, 
of the of the systems of effectiveness and so on. So definitely, um, and this is one of the things. It is a bit of a quandary because whilst we have really effective treatment, the people are much less frightened of it. Um, it has uh, resulted in some sort of a complacency, and um, uh, um, you know that is sort of set into people not not taking precautions. Um, like everything else, it is human nature. So that's also a challenge for us who are on the prevention side, who, who, who have who talk about education and trying to make sure people don't don't get infected. Is how do we get people energized and, and to, to take um, the prevention message uh, seriously? So um, all these things feed into uh, making our prevention programs and campaigns a bit more complicated. You talk about the risk of complacency setting in. Have you noticed that HIV or AIDS cases rising in Singapore? I, actually, uh, you know, we've been doing this work for, for over three decades. We've been um, ensuring that, that AIDS is always on the front burner and uh, we're not, do, we don't uh, um, forget about it. So that's, that's our, our mission is really to make sure that people re continue to to guard against it and we always make sure that our programs are up to date. And over the last few years, we've actually managed to flatten the curve of HIV in Singapore and in many parts of the world as well. And in fact, in the last two years, um, we have actually dropped the number of new infections fairly significantly. The result really of coordinated efforts by many organizations, agencies and individuals, making sure that, that um, you know, the programs are not, do not, uh, all the way, we keep our eye on the ball. So we have we have really come a long way, not just in the treatment of persons with already uh, already infected with HIV, but also making sure that that people um, the persons at risk, what we call key populations at risk, um, are provided all the information and access to prevention and so on that uh, we can actually attain our objective. And our really our objective is really to end HIV something which is a fairly audacious um, objective, but with um, science and, and information and programming, we can, we feel we can do it. And this is the objective, not just of us in Singapore, but many people around the world, um, that we want to actually end HIV as a major public health um, threat. And until we realize that, I believe uh, Action for AIDS will continue its many programs that you run to uh, bring education to the forefront with regards to HIV and AIDS. Give us an idea of some of the programs that you roll out. Uh, you mentioned that you have, you have been able to you know, help uh, flatten the curve uh, somewhat over the last few years. But what sort of programs are going ahead uh, further upstream perhaps uh, to those who, who are um, you know, the more vulnerable groups in society? We have, we have two very large programs. Uh, this is in primary prevention, education, um, awareness building. One of them targeting men of sex with men. We've had this for 30 years now. Um, it, 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 it uses various avenues um, to reach out, to get people to be aware, to get tested and so on. Uh, working with venues, working online, social media, um, working at test sites and so on. And the second very large group, uh, primary prevention cap, uh, program we have targets high-risk heterosexual males. And these are men who um, may have sex with sex workers and have multiple partners. And that program works through, again, um, um, various venues, for example, bars, clubs, uh, and so on, coffee shops, um, working at ferry terminals, to increase the awareness and, and maintain the awareness on sex, uh, safe, safer sex, condom use, getting tested and so on. Those are two very large programs. We also run anonymous testing. Uh, we have a, a mobile van that, 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 makes, that brings testing out into the community. Um, and we work a lot with uh, our stakeholders, our partners who are in the community to make sure that the message is consistent and it's accurate and it's, and it's maintained. So those are some of the main programs. I, I'd like to also say maybe to, to, to stress that, that um, with treatment, with very effective HIV treatment, um, patients are rendered, un, they, they cannot transmit HIV to their sexual partners. This is what the, a global uh, effort to um, make people realize that 
undetectable viral load is untransmissible. So patients who are on optimum treatment, optimum antiretroviral treatment, are no more infectious to their sexual partners, even without using uh, condoms or protection, or other protection. So that's really important. And I think that has also been a very strong effort, a strong, re a big reason why we have managed to slow down, to flatten the curve, and even to drop. So we are attacking transmission from various ways, from the treatment point where we, we treat persons who are infected, to make them un un non-infectious, and then also talk about primary prevention. Now, Professor, last Saturday you held the first part of the 12th Singapore AIDS Conference, and the second part of this virtual conference will be held this Saturday, the 5th of December. What's the aim of this year's webinar? Well, you know, the, we've had these uh, biannual meetings since 1998. This is the 12th in the series, and um, it's an opportunity for everyone of us who are involved in what we call the AIDS community in Singapore, from healthcare workers to um, stakeholders, community partners, to patients, persons living with HIV and their families, um, to donors, to public uh, health experts, to get together to, to just, you know, re recap and to um, look at what, what we've been doing so far, where, where we've come. Um, this year, we, because of, the, of, of COVID, I mean, everyone's on virtual, so we're having two virtual, um, two, two days of virtual webinars. Uh, and, and the first two webinars last, last Saturday dealt with the impact on COVID, the impact COVID has had on programs, on our HIV programs, some of which I mentioned earlier on. And the second webinar had to do with how far we had come um, in, in ending HIV from the Asian Pacific perspective to the local perspective. Uh, so it really draws together a crowd of people, a group of people who are really uh, committed to, to, to this cause. Um, you mentioned this Saturday, we have really good, two really interesting webinars, one of which focuses on pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, and the second of which looks at the possibility of an AIDS, of an AIDS or HIV cure. So maybe I, if you allow me to talk about the first one, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis. It's a really big thing in, in, in the AIDS, uh, AIDS, AIDS uh, prevention world now, and it's really the use of um, effective antiretroviral medication, taking one tablet um, a day to prevent, to stop being infected with HIV. Um, and in countries where they, in cities in particular, where they have scaled up effectively the, the, the adoption of PrEP, they've seen uh, numbers drop significantly, and this is going to be a major, a major prong, a, a major um, um, strategy if we want to end HIV. So we want to talk more about PrEP in Singapore, um, where we are now, and how we are in, uh, promoting it, and so on. Um, so that's that's one big thing coming out Saturday, and and then the other webinar I mentioned also is the possibility of AIDS cure and. Um, uh, scientists, basic, and researchers have been working very hard on on looking at possibility of actually getting rid of, of HIV in the body, from the body. So one doesn't have to take medication all their lives, um, and it'll be. And and I think that the science has come very far in in getting there. Uh, there will also be a, a discussion on vaccines, um, possible HIV vaccine in the future. Um, and and uh, there will be panel discussions on around these two topics. Right, and uh, registration is still open for those who are interested to join. Yes, it is still open. Um, yeah, it's on our website. Uh, you can, um, and it's free of charge, obviously. Uh, and we welcome anybody, pub members of the public are, who are interested can also join in. It's right. very educational. Right, and that's the second part of the 12th Singapore AIDS Conference. It's going to be a virtual conference taking place this Saturday, 1 p.m. And once again, as Professor Chan had mentioned, you can visit Action for AIDS Singapore's website at afa.org.sg. Professor Chan, thank you so much for spending time with us on World AIDS Day and educating our listeners also about uh, where we are currently in our battle against HIV AIDS. Professor Roy Chan is President for Action for AIDS Singapore. Thank you very much.